the information that I'm gonna share with you is not something you'll find anywhere else on the internet. As far as I know, I tried to find it and I couldn't. <laughs> so. So I spent one month traveling all around Afghanistan and I didn't do it with any organized tour group. So I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. So that's what I'm gonna share with you because there's a lot of things that I wish I knew <laughs> before I went on my trip. Afghanistan is a beautiful place with some of the most hospitable people in the world, but there are definitely challenges with traveling there. And so I will hopefully this video will make it easier for you guys. To be completely honest, I'm not sure why none of this information is on the internet. Um, you know, I really couldn't find it anywhere. I imagine that other vloggers who are going to Afghanistan now don't want to put the information out because they don't want other people going because it makes their content less original. I think people also want to seem braver than they are sometimes. So I've seen so many titles of videos that say solo female traveler in Afghanistan. And then I clicked on it because I was like, oh, sweet. This will tell me how to figure things out. And then they actually meet up with a guide like as soon as they arrive in Afghanistan. And then that person is with them 24 seven, which is totally not the same thing. And then also the rules are changing. So in the last couple of months, actually there was a big change and I'll get into that later. Um, but I think that's like another reason why this information is difficult to surface. Another reason might be just cause like making this kind of video is just not that much fun. Uh, you know, just uh, informational. So I don't know if you could like, like this video or subscribe, help the channel, that'd be great. Thank you. All right, now let's get started. Okay, so first let's just talk about the elephant in the room, the Taliban. <laughs> what do they think of tourists and what is it like to interact with them as a tourist? Because this is the face of the Taliban in the news. However, this is also the face of the Taliban helping a tourist catch baby sheep. <laughs> In my experience and in many other foreigners' experience, the interactions with them are positive. As an organization, they want tourists and it is in their best interest to ensure that you do not become a news story. <laughs> so they want you to be protected. They want you to be safe. So from a security perspective, now is the safest time <clears throat> in a long time to visit Afghanistan because now that the Taliban are in power, the security situation is much more stable. You know, during the previous regime, the biggest source of insurgency was the Taliban, so now they're in power. There are threats of attacks and kidnappings, but it's not from the Taliban now, it's from the Islamic State, but they're much, much smaller insurgency and have much less support. So, you know, we're living in a different world now. Previously, the Taliban a couple of years ago would have happily kidnapped me. Now they give me extra security. For example, in Bamiyan, when it was me and another girl going to see the statues and they don't allow to women to just be by themselves. So a Taliban soldier came as extra security and followed us around for two hours and helped us take pictures. So yeah, uh, don't let the media scare you away from the Taliban. Um, you know, as long as they can identify that you are a tourist, a guest visiting their country, your interaction with them will either be like neutral to positive. So of course the friendliness and openness of whoever you're interacting with depends on the individual. And sometimes you might get a friendly person and sometimes you might get an unfriendly Taliban. Um, it also, you know, depends on your passport to an extent as well as an American, you instantly arouse suspicion, of course. You know, if, if I say like Hindustan, then everyone's like, okay, cool. But you know, even as an American, I was able to have positive interactions with Taliban. The thing that's important is having them know that you're a tourist. And so this can be trickier when you're traveling independently. So that's what we'll get into next. I wanna be clear that I'm just speaking about, you know, interactions of tourists with them. I'm not speaking for locals. Um, and this isn't a political commentary. <laughs> Security situation in places like Afghanistan are constantly changing. And so it's always good to keep up to date, talk to locals for accurate information. So this isn't North Korea. You do not need to have an organized tour group to get into the country. The benefits of having one is that 
they do everything for you, right? So they get your visa, they handle all the logistics, permits, and just everything is taken care of. And you're just like, do do do. Everything will be taken care of and someone is with you 24 seven. And uh, it is definitely the easiest way to do things. The downside though, is that it will cost you a lot more than it should, like a lot. So it'll run you thousands of dollars. Like I was quoted 1700 for a seven day trip, 2000 for seven days. Um, yeah, it's pretty high, thousands of dollars. And, um, you know, personally, I like figuring things out too. You know, I don't want like someone who's like babysitting me and taking me around everywhere. I like to move around on my own and I like the challenge of getting around. And if I'm going to spend thousands of dollars and I'd rather spend the money in the country because a lot of these organized tour companies are run by people outside of Afghanistan. And so most of the money doesn't go to the people on the ground who are doing the work, like the guides. It's a dying economy, they need the money. So <laughs> uh, you know, the security is good, but the economy is not. <laughs> that being said, traveling without an organized tour is more difficult. You'll have to arrange your own travel. So first you'll have to arrange your visa. There are currently three countries in the world where you can go to the embassy and get a visa fairly easily. You can go to the UAE and then you can fly to Kabul from Dubai or Abu Dhabi. You can go to Iran and fly or cross by land into Afghanistan, or you can get your visa in Pakistan and then cross by land or fly from Islamabad. So I got my visa in Peshawar in Pakistan and then cross by land through Torhan. So flying is definitely recommended. It is by far the easiest way to enter the country. It might be more expensive though. I've seen flights for about 100, 150 from Islamabad and possibly the same from Dubai and, and Abu Dhabi, but I'm not sure. The visa is single entry, 30 days. You could possibly get a better price. There's not like a set price where you go in and you pay that. People have paid different amounts. The person first said 150 to me, and then I said, I'll give you a hundred bucks. And they also did ask for two passport photos and a photocopy of my passport. And I said, I don't have that. All I have is this hundred dollar bill. So, and they were like, okay. <laughs> and they took that and I had it within minutes. So it's very, very quick. I am, I think $80 is what someone inside Afghanistan said I should have paid. I've also heard that people paid $150. I personally find these things to be very, very interesting because going to the Afghanistan consulate was unlike any other consulate I had ever been to. So there's like a separate ladies and, and men's entrance. And then the ladies entrance is great though, cause there's no line. So I just like waltz right in. But then there's a little like holding cell room <laughs> that you go in before you can actually go inside a, a real building. And then there's ladies in there and they, they check you and then they put a burqa on you, like a full burqa with just the, the grill holes. Um, and then you can go inside and see the immigration officer and get your visa. And I, that was an experience. Anyway, the visa legally allows you to be in the country, but most Taliban not know what a visa is and do not understand the concept of a tourist <laughs> in their country. Understandably, many people throughout the world do not understand this concept. When you arrive, you'll want to register yourself at the tourism office and get permits that authorize you to be a tourist that does tourist things like taking pictures and all of that stuff. So these permits will make it a breeze for you to go through checkpoints. And then if someone stops you and asks you questions about what are you doing, like taking a picture of that thing, which does happen, it happened to me a couple of times, then you can show this document and then they know who you are. As of a couple of months ago, you need to have a local person, an interpreter, who will sign off on your permits. And this person, this local, gives their ID to sign off on the permits and now they are responsible for you. And you sign a paper that says you will adhere to customs and you are allowed to change your interpreter, your guide at any time, but you should inform them. The permits are free. But it takes a couple of hours at the office and you'll get them on the same day. So ideally you would come with your entire itinerary and then you can get permits for all the provinces and you tell them the dates that you want to be there. 
and then you can get all the permits to travel. And to do the process correctly, you need to check in at the tourism office when you go to each province. So this is the proper procedure that is not really documented anywhere. <laughs> Later in the video, I will give information on how to find a guide. The reason why the rules changed a couple of months ago is because of an incident that went viral that someone posted when they were a tourist here in Kabul. And so it was, it's minor, honestly, but it went viral. And now you need to be with an interpreter. So there are people that travel without any permits whatsoever, and that is possible. But if you get stopped by a Taliban soldier um, at a checkpoint or in a city or whatever, they might get suspicious <laughs> and not know who you are, what you're doing there. And in that case, they will detain you. So when you get detained, then they start an investigation to figure out who you are. And until they are certain that you are not any sort of threat, you're not a journalist or whatever it is, they're not a spy, then they will let you out and it will take days. I've heard of people being detained for maybe a few days to a week for the Indians I know that got detained. I think your ability to travel independently around Afghanistan depends on like a few things. One, how, are you taking a lot of pictures and videos and like, do you wanna be like, a tourist or a vlogger because in that case you're definitely going to be going to run into Taliban asking you questions because the instant they see someone taking a picture they get suspicious so I don't like that the second thing is just like do you blend in <laughs> like if you look like a foreigner then that's going to be a problem if you're a woman you can always just like I don't know throw a burqa on your passport is also very very important so if you're Indian they love you if you're American they're suspicious of you and so be mindful of that <laughs> So everyone is allowed to fly on their own and that's all good. Even if you're a woman, you can go, you're not allowed to actually go by road distances longer than 72 kilometers. I'm not sure where that magic neighbor come from, magic number came from, but that's just what it is. Um, so plane is preferable if you want to avoid any hassle. I did however take share cars around and there are buses. I was denied bus tickets on a number of occasions for longer rides, but share cars, there were no problem and I could just like blend in because <laughs> I look like I'm an Afghan woman and so I usually didn't get stopped. The thing to keep in mind about flights is that everything connects to Kabul. So so first of all, a flight is around 60 to 70 bucks and they're all in like in the morning. And so if you want to go from like Kabul to Herat or Mazar or whatever, um, you can do that. But if you want to go from another city like Herat to Mazar, then you'll have to connect through Kabul. So you'll You'll have a day flight where you fly to Kabul and you either take a car to Mazar that day or you have to fly the next day to Mazar. Um, as far as I know, there were no flights that didn't go to Kabul. <laughs> money. This is an important one because you're gonna want money and there are no ATMs here that work because of US sanctions. So you need to come into the country with all the money that you will need. It is possible to send money to yourself via Western Union or MoneyGram. However, they took a good percentage in fees. So I used Couchsurfing to make contacts for Afghanistan. I don't know if you know about it, but if you go to couchsurfing.com, then you'll see what it is. It's for travelers and you can request people to like stay on their couch or if you can host people. Um, it's a great way to meet locals or host foreigners if you want to like meet other travelers so there's a really nice network of people that are very very helpful to tourists and help them get around you can find people on there that can give you advice all the way to you know be your paid translator on your trip another group that's very useful for finding out information is eps every passport stamp the facebook group and I actually only learned about it last year, but apparently everybody that travels like all of these weird places is in it. And I was just late to the, to the game. So a guide could cost you like $15 for a local translator to like $50 for a professional guide. If you want to really go to places that not many people have seen and go more in depth, I would suggest paying more. Something to keep in mind is that if 
the person doesn't have accommodation in the province that you're going to, then you'll have to cover that accommodation. So it can be help. It can be really good to find guides in regions or areas or figure out like, you know, do they have places to stay that are, so you don't have to cover that part of it. Food is pretty cheap, so that's not a big deal. Um, accommodation will run around like $20 in each city. So, you know, if you add that up with like the daily rate, then it could add up. But if you're a guy and your guide is a guy, then you could both like share a room. But like if you're a girl and your guide is a guy, then that's a problem. I think the best way is to just join forces with other tourists traveling at the same time. Um, if there is interest in a way to find other travelers and make groups, then like I might try and figure out a way to do that because I didn't know how to find other people that were traveling at the same time. I'm gonna put some contact info in the description box and other information, so please do look at that. Uh, if you wanna to travel to Afghanistan, don't hesitate to contact me. I will, I will do what I can to route you to the relevant information sources. So, yeah. I honestly did not feel particularly unsafe as a woman. Uh, maybe my judgment is just bad. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I really did not feel, you know, threatened by other men around me. You know, I went in share cars where I didn't know anybody and it was all men. And they were honestly like very, very, very kind, like very kind and went to like, they, they put in like extra effort to make me feel comfortable and you know that was very very nice what do you have to do you have to wear a hijab um you need long sleeves of course so like not this um you want to be fully covered pants um but it doesn't have to be like the abaya or anything you don't have to wear a burqa you don't have to cover your face at this moment in time it is legal for you to have your face showing the last time when the taliban was in power um it was stricter and you had to have a face covering now that is not the case however that may change in time so there are news articles that t say you need a face covering and those are actually wrong what happened is that there was a decree that was passed that was not passed it was just someone someone some taliban official said that you know face coverings will be mandatory but it never passed at this moment in time though you just have to do this you just put this thing over your head <laughs> And then you do this and then it's like, voila, you're done. It's, um, I didn't feel like it was so strict. Like, um, initially I thought like, oh, all your hairs have to be covered. Like you have to like go like this, don't have any hair showing, but it's like, it's okay. You can do this. Um, yeah, it's not so bad. So I didn't really have a problem with the hijab. It can be a little frustrating at times <laughs> because you're not allowed to do certain things and you know, when I was like denied bus tickets, I was very not happy. <laughs> I was like, I'm a grown woman, give me a bus ticket. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. I, I, it's, it's still a good experience. You can do it, so you should do it. If you're a woman, I encourage you to go still. It, uh, for me, one of the deterrents was reading about uh, you know, the different things that women were banned from. And I read that Afghan women are not allowed to go into like most, many of the tourist attractions. So like I wanted to go see a Buskashi game and you know, go to the Citadel in Herat and the rules actually are that women aren't allowed. But if you are a foreign woman, uh, a permit will get you in. And also it's like not so, so strict. Oh, uh, when you go to restaurants, um, a lot of times there will be a woman and children section, like a family section. So like there uh, is like a curtained area in the back. So in the beginning, I was at times forgetting that and I would like just waltz in and sit down and they'd be like, ma'am, no, 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 no. And then they'd like shoo me off into the corner. Um, so, but you know, as an introvert, sometimes it was like kind of nice. I was like, thank you. I really didn't want any human interaction. So please just put me in my little curtained like box and I'm happy here. <laughs> So drones are banned. Um, I did fly my drone, it was confiscated. I did finally eventually get it back thanks to many people, many, many, many people helping me. I appreciate I appreciate all of you, FYI. Okay, so you're obviously walking into a very conservative society and you know, you'll see the women with only maybe the eyes at most showing and 
it is taboo for them to show their faces in public. It is 100% taboo for them to have their faces shown and plastered on the internet, right? So um, be very careful about where you point your camera. Be very mindful of that. Language, what do they speak? There are two main languages. You will see Dari and Pashto. Pashto is spoken by the Pashtun people and that is also the language that the Taliban speak. I downloaded the Google offline dictionary for Persian and that was very, very helpful. So that's how I was able to like get a share car and communicate with people in the share car and all of that. All right, here's some phrases that I learned. Khubasti, uh, that's, uh, how are you? Khubam uh, is, I'm good or I'm fine. Khubam, um, namshist is, what is your name? I really liked that one. So I would just walk around and be like, salam, namshist. 